This morning we preach the first part of a second lesson in a series of lessons called Learning to Love. And it is focused on what Jesus said is the greatest commandment of all, to love God. We did not, were not able to record live the lesson part two that we preached Sunday night, June 19th with the Lakeview Church of Christ, but we wanted to uh, record that now so that we could post that, that it may be beneficial to those who would have access to it at the YouTube channel, the Bible Search YouTube channel and BibleSearch.com, uh, our w the website. And so we want to po to do that now, but we remind us of what we had studied in the morning lesson and have posted as well that loving God must be the first consuming devoted commitment of our lives loving God in fact is the focus of our lives not just a small part of our lives we can only learn to love God as we learn and respond to his love for us God is love and has shown his great love in sending Jesus to die for our sins. And the more we meditate and learn about his love for us, the more we will be willing to love him and be submissive and obedient to all of his commands that he has given us to follow. Then we have three points we want to touch on in this lesson. That loving God means reverently listening to God's word. It was Jesus the night before he died on the cross that had an attitude of uh, godliness, a godly fear, where he cautiously approached the Father, uh, depending on him to answer prayers to strengthen him uh, as he was going to the cross to die for our sins showing us the example of the godly fear that we should display the reverence toward the Father in prayer and in living our lives each day. Hebrews 5 and verse 7, In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety translated in other places, godly fear. And so Jesus displayed that we ought to respectfully, reverently, not casually and disrespectfully approach the Father uh, in prayer. In Luke 22, verse 41 and following, we see the attitude of Jesus as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, l remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And so we see Jesus praying to God in agonizing prayer, but reverently respecting God his Father, who had the power to save him from death, and in fact did save him from death. It is the scriptures, the word of God, that provide the commandments of God, the will of God, and we should reverence the will of God. As we reverence God, we must hold the word of God in great respect, that this is the mind and will of God that is to be uh, followed above all in all aspects of our life, and that the word of God is capable of guiding us in living as a Christian and carrying out all of the relationships in this life in a way that will please God, whether it be spouse, parent, child, 
worker, a worshiper, working with a local congregation, whatever it is, God has the complete instructions that we must follow and that we can trust in and have confidence in that it will provide what is needed for us to follow uh, in order to accomplish whatever he would have us do in all of these relationships. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That is, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work in all of these areas. And we do not have, and we should not have to turn to the world and their wisdom that is lacking in reverence for God uh, to learn how to be a parent, a a spouse, a, a worker or worshiper, how we should behave uh, in any of these areas. God has, has the complete guidance and revelation that we need and that we should trust in and submit to. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 29, we see the attitude again we are to have toward God and hearing God's word an attitude of reverence and godly fear. Looking back to Mount Sinai when God uh, spoke to the children of Israel and the mountain was uh, a, filled with fire and uh, lightning and quaking, displaying the power of God in a, in a physical manifestation. Hebrews 12, 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And so God threatened that if they came close to the mountain, they would be destroyed uh, for not respecting him and as he spoke to them at Mount Sinai, how much more will we escape if we respect the one who is speaking from heaven through his divine word in the scripture? Verse 26, And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake the, not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken uh, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. In other words, God, when Jesus comes again, all the created things will be destroyed, including the heaven and the earth, and what will remain that is not shaken will be his heavenly kingdom of which we can be a part if we reverently respect and obey his will, showing love for God. Verse 28, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, with godly fear and awe, the same word, uh, for piety that we found in Hebrews 5 and verse 7. For our God is a consuming fire. And so we are to reverently, reverently respect uh, the word of God, for that's what it is, the word of God, not the word of men. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. And so the word of God working as God intends it to do as we reverently uh, listen and apply and obey that word. Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13 so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, 
not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and tr- with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to work at will and to work for His good pleasure. So both in the intentions and motives that you have for doing anything for. Uh, in service to God and in the way that you do that it is God's word that is working in you Uh, so respect God and his word with fear and trembling as you follow that knowing that your salvation uh, is is at stake in the attitude in which we are to have uh, in obeying him Then we come to the point where we are to love God, uh, that it means humbly obeying God's word, that we are but children, even if we have been Christians for a long time, children of God who need guidance and who need to follow always his word without varying from that word to the right or to the left. Jesus set that example for us to follow, humbly obeying all of the Father's will while on earth. John 8 and verse 29, he said, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That is, always obeying the Father's will. John 14 and verse 31 again, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. Jesus said, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. And that's exactly what he did. And as he obeyed the Father's will, the Father expressed love toward him uh, in, in that way. John 15, verse 9, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Again, humbly obeying the word of God is an expression of loving God. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Then in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So again, humbly obeying the word of God, lowering ourselves before God as we ought to do. Whatever, Lord, you would have me do, I am willing to do it and do it with joy, not grudgingly. 1 John 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. This is the love of God, obeying God willingly and joyously, following the example of Jesus. In Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, although he was a son, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he, may, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. And so the idea is that Jesus humbly obeyed the will of God. And Paul said we ought to have that attitude of Jesus within ourselves, that we humble ourselves before God and seek to obey his word in all things. Philippians 2 and verse 5, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
But what did he do when the glory and position with God was not a thing to be held on to? But emptied himself, making himself of no reputation, some translations say, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus humbly obeying the word of God, becoming obedient to the point of death. Then in Acts 17 and verse 11, the attitude of the Bereans is the attitude that we ought to have toward the word of God. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, where they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And that is the attitude that even on the day of Pentecost, those who heard the gospel uh, for the first time preached in the world, thousands obeyed the gospel to become Christians. When they heard in Acts 2 and verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Then what did many thousands do? Verse 37 of Acts 2, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and Peter and the rest of the apostles' brethren, What shall we do? They, they turned from their wrong thinking about Jesus and their actions, and now they're saying, What shall we do? How can we be saved? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, change your mind about your sins, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what they were to do. Repent and be baptized that they might be saved. And on that day, that's what Thousands did. Verse 41, So then those who had received his word were baptized, immersed in water, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So they learned how to live as Christians and worship God according uh, to the apostles' teaching. And when We stumble and fall as Christians into sin, which we often do. As the covetous Simon, uh, who had become a Christian but wanted to buy the miraculous transferring of power to be able to do that uh, from the apostles, he was rebuked in Acts 8 and verse 22. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. And so the idea was Simon was to repent and pray, confessing his sin to God and the blood of Jesus would cleanse him, as it did when he did that and as it does when we do that today as Christians who were once baptized for the forgiveness of all past sins as we fall into sin again then that is God's terms of pardon that we are to follow, that we may continue to humbly learn and apply his word by his grace uh, as as we seek to have that humble, obedient attitude uh, continue by the grace of God. And then finally, we are to love God. It means seeking his glory his splendid approval above all, obeying his word. This is what was wrong with the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day, the Jewish leaders. It is what is wrong with many today. They seek the approval of one another rather than the approval of God. In John 5, verses 39 through 44, 
We read, you search the scriptures, Jesus said, because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, Jesus said. But what did they receive? Uh, John 5 and verse 42. But I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Why didn't they have the love of God in themselves to obey uh, the word of God? I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. That was the whole problem. Seeking the approval of men rather than the eternal approval of God was the whole problem that they were running into. And it, it is why many, even after hearing a lesson like this, many will not turn to God because they don't want to be disapproved by those whose approval they are seeking. And they are willing to be disapproved and condemned by God rather than seeking the, the glory, the splendor, and approval of God. In John 17 and verse 1, Jesus, the night before he died, spoke these things. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Honor your Son. Approve your Son, that the Son may honor you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And then what is eternal life? Verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. And if we are going to glorify or honor God and love God, it is through obedience to uh, submission to his word and that's what Jesus said I have accomplished the work all of the work that you have given me to do that's how he honored his father verse 5 now father glorify me together with your with you or with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was and so Jesus says I want to be honored again as I was honored before I came back, before I came to the earth in the flesh and uh, glorify me in that way when I return to heaven. He was concerned about being honored by his heavenly father, not about being honored by those who were rejecting his heavenly father. And then verses 20 through 26, as he continues to pray to his heavenly Father on behalf of those who would be believe in him through the words of the apostles, the gospel. That would include us today who have become Christians in the way that the scriptures teach that we just read from Acts chapter 2. John 17 and verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, of his twelve, of the apostles, the eleven at this time, but for those also who believe in me through their word, including us today, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me that we obediently follow the will of the Father, not veering from the left or to the right. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. That is the glorious word of the gospel by which we are to be unified. 
Verse 23, I, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus said, I want them to be in heaven with me that they may see how splendidly you honored me because of your love for me even before the foundation of the world. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father all being eternally God. Then verse 25 and 26, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, Yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And so Jesus made it clear that he wants us to love one another like the Father has loved him and that this is accomplished by submitting to his will and seeking his glory, his honor, his splendor, that eternal reward above all, even if we are disapproved by the entire and condemned by the entire world, we seek the glory of God even above all. And as we draw this second part of this wonderful lesson about loving God, the greatest commandment of all that affects all of our service to God, it's Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, that is, in baptism, for the forgiveness of your sins, buried with Christ, raised with him, to walk in newness of life, according to Romans 6. Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Seek to live as Christ would have you live. Seek, seek to honor Christ in worship and, and the Father while on the earth. Seek to become like him day by day. Seek to one day be with him in eternal glory. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And we will one day, to whatever measure God gives us, experience that eternal splendor and honor and reward that will last on into eternity greater than any temporary type of reward that we could ever receive uh, from humanity here on the earth. We need to do that, seek his glory above all if we're going to love him. And as we close, we summarize that loving God again is the first consuming, devoted, commitment of our lives it is a way of life to love God it means we can only learn to love him as we learn about his love for us and as we respond to it and we respond to it by reverently listening to God's word and as we reverently listen to God's word we humbly obey all of God's word as Jesus set that example, even willing to go to the cross for our, our sins. And loving God means seeking his glory above all, obeying his word that we might be able to one day be in that eternal glory with Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the heavenly host and angels, and the redeemed of all ages that we might one day be with them for eternity in whatever that may mean, whatever that is involved, 
and we seek his reward above all in spite of being rejected by the world. If anyone is subject to this invitation that the Lord continually offers through his gospel, why not turn and become a child of God today, begin loving God, acknowledging that we have sinned against God, acknowledging that we need the grace of God through Jesus, not telling Jesus how we are going to be saved through a sinner's prayer, which is not in the word of God, but by following the, those terms of pardon through faith in Christ that leads to repentance, changing our minds about our sins, that leads to confessing him as the son of God, as the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, that we believe he is God along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and that he is reigning in heaven above all at the right hand of God after being raised from the dead, after dying for our sins, and immediately as soon as possible being baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Jesus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of our sins, that we may be buried with Christ, baptized into his death, raised up out of the water by the grace of God, by the power of the blood of Jesus, cleansed from our sins by that faith that obeys God, and then to walk in that newness of life, learning to love God by the apostles' teaching to worship and live as Christians in this life. And if we have fallen from that, and we do from time to time, and we sin against God after being baptized, let us be willing to repent, confess our sins to God, and pray to God that we might be forgiven of those sins, and he will forgive us, and let us continue to grow in his grace and knowledge and love for him, becoming more and more obedient joyously to his word, looking forward to that eternal glory. If anyone is subject to that invitation, that gospel invitation, we would encourage all to respond as soon as possible as we now today draw our lesson to a close.